Hello everyone. Uh, it's fantastic to be back and to have so many people watching. The last in our series of Building a Better World with Words in partnership with Five Leaves Bookshop. Uh, my name is Sandeep Mahal and I have the great honour of heading up Nottingham's prestigious UNESCO City of Literature designation. Now before I introduce our guest, uh, a bit of housekeeping that you've all become uh, familiar with. Uh, please head on over to the chat room and let us know who you are and uh, where you are listening in from. If you have a question for any of our guests, post your question in the Q&A section that you can see along the bottom of your screen and we'll pick up those questions during the event. We have Pippa here from Five Leaves Bookshop in the chat who is ready and waiting to answer any book related questions and do make the most of their three for two offer on all books by our guest authors. And so to tonight, I am really delighted to have two wonderful guests, uh, authors Rachel Joyce and S.J. Watson. Rachel is the author of the Sunday Times and international bestsellers, The Unlikely Pilgrimage of Harold Fry, Perfect, The Love Song of Miss Queenie Hennessy, The Music Shop and a collection of interlinked stories, A Snow Garden and Other Stories. Her new novel, Miss Benson's Beetle, is out now. S.J. Watson's first novel, Before I Go to Sleep, became a phenomenal international success and has now sold over six million copies worldwide. Truly phenomenal. It won the Crime Writers Association Award for Best Debut Novel and the Galaxy National Book Award for Crime Thriller of the Year. His second novel, Second Life, uh, a psychological thriller, was published in 2015 and his new novel, Final Cut, is out on the 8th of August. It's so, sorry, 6th of August, a week today, uh, forgive me. Um, so lovely to see you both. Um, and Rachel, I, I really want to start uh, with you. Um, I first read Harold Fry and I knew it was going to be a favourite uh, with book clubs, with librarians and, and booksellers everywhere. And I've read everything by you ever since and your new novel, Miss Benson's uh, Beetle, is an extraordinary um, inspirational novel about women who don't fit society's expectation and, and the journey of self-discovery um, that they go on. Could you tell us a little bit about Miss Benson's Beetle and a little bit about the inspiration behind the novel? Yes, Miss Benson's Beetle is in a nutshell the story of two women, Marjorie Benson, and her assistant Enid Pretty, who leave 1950s Britain behind and travel to the other side of the world in search of a golden beetle that may or may not exist. The idea originally came about because um, I'd written, I'd finished my last book, The Music Shop, and I suddenly began to wonder why, as a woman, I wasn't putting women at the heart of my writing. It, it just seemed such a, a, a kind of an absence. I mean, I'd, I'd had women that I, you know, I really liked in the books, but I'd never kind of just made women the centre uh, exclusively. So I felt it was time to write a book about, um, to kind of celebrate female friendship. But I didn't just want to kind of do an emotional study of friendship. So that was when I decided that I would send these two women on the most spectacular adventure. Um, and, and in order to do it, I, I read all those kind of classic male adventure stories, you know, like kind of Kidnapped and Rogue Male and 39 Steps, all of them. And I just thought, how can I use this genre specifically for women? And, and that, that was the start of the book, really. That's absolutely um, terrific because it feels like they do go on this absolutely thrilling, thrilling adventure. Um, and, and the character and... and, and development and the transformation that Marjorie and Enid go on you feel like you kind of go on that journey with them and and this unlikely friendship begins to blossom they have this fantastic energy to them and I just wanted to know what it was like for you to write those characters was it a real energy boost for you it was extraordinary I hadn't banked on how liberating it would feel to write you know to write women just to write women and, uh, and I also, because I'd chosen two complete opposites, I'd chosen Marjorie, who is in her late 40s and who's led a pretty hidden life and uh, is quite afraid, I would say, and not really very good at expressing how she feels and pretty set in her ways. 
I paired her with this young woman who's just such an extrovert and who arrives to travel you know, on a basically on a kind of expedition to the other side of the world. She arrives in a pink travel suit with far too much luggage, most of which is kind of bottles of scent. But when I put them together, they just have this really bold energy. And that's what I, I found so thrilling. I kind of really felt in my boots with it. It was, I mean, I just didn't feel afraid of kind of pushing, pushing the novel to extremes. It felt, it felt great for women. And, and where do you think those characters um, come from? How do you then start to weave that magic, I guess, the magic that makes it such a thrilling travel adventure? I think partly uh, they are, I mean, because one is an introvert classically and the other is an extrovert. I mean, I think I probably just pushed extremes of myself really in, into kind of into these two women. And um, it, it's, it, it's in essence, the, the women can't find what they need to find until they find the, you know, Marjorie has to find the extrovert in herself and Enid has to find the introvert. They kind of haven't got balance yet. So I think probably when you put those two energies together, you do get something quite explosive, especially if you put them in the middle of a tropical rainforest where they've never been. <laughs> yes, indeed. Um, I mean, it is a narrative stuffed full of, misadventures and tragedy and joy. I mean, testing times that bring out, as you say, their resilience and endurance uh, in the face of such um, challenging experiences. Um, do you have a reading that you could share with us just to give people um, a, a flavor of the language and, and, and the adventure? I'd love to. So I thought actually I would, um, I mean, we'll take it as a given that they're going to travel, they are going to get to the other side of the world. And this little bit is actually, um, their first night out in the wild. And uh, Enid has taken to it, surprise, surprise, like a duck to water and has a small dog with her that has, she just has this habit of picking things up, just follow her everywhere. So now she has this small dog called Mr. Rawlings, but Marjorie is finding it much harder than she realized. And she is now staring at a hammock. How does a woman get into a hammock when she's not got into a hammock before? Enid asked if she needed help, but Marjorie still peeked after the business with the tent and also her confession that she had never been on an expedition before insisted she could manage. Enid seemed to mount her hammock with no difficulty whatsoever. One moment she was on the ground, the next she was in a hammock. She even had her dog, Mr. Rawlings, with her, his ears glowing in the dark. Sleep well, Marge. Marjorie's hammock was, was less amenable. She tried one leg first. It went swinging off with her a little bit on it, but mostly not. She tried taking it by surprise, mounting suddenly. The hammock accepted her weight, then performed a full cartwheel and tossed her out the other side, dumping her in a load of spikes. In the end, she gave a leap and pitched herself. She landed on her front, her mouth mashed against the canvas, rocking violently, but still she had done it. Technically, she was in a hammock. No one could argue with that, though she could barely move without the risk of depositing herself back on the ground. It took a lot of effort to roll herself the right way up. She pulled the mosquito net around her. But sleep? How could she possibly do that? Who in their right mind would even close their eyes? The bungalow was one thing, but at least there had been the pretense of a roof and some walls. This was terrifying. Her senses felt sharpened like pencils. Her torch was about as much use as a paddle boat in the ocean. She heard whistles and screams from creatures she'd never even had nightmares about, let alone seen. Rough cawing, lunatic whooping, once a clang. When a pale shadow took shape, she lay taut as a trap, her eyes so wide they could have popped, until it gave a snort and became a pig. More whistling, more twitching. Another animal that screamed as if it was being eaten alive. She thought of Enid, the gun, then something landed on her face. Possibly it meant no harm. Possibly it mistook her for something friendly or at least inanimate. But Marjorie did not feel friendly and neither did she feel inanimate. Her first instinct was to bat it, unwise. It got meshed in her net, flapping and squeaking, a bat. She had batted a bat. And now Marjorie was panicking and the bat was panicking and there was something in her mouth, but it was not a bat, it was her net. And even though the bat had flown free, she was swinging wildly up, down, up, down, like an awful ride at the fair, while a hundred mosquitoes zoomed in to bite her. The dawn chorus came miles before dawn. It was actually the middle of the night. Nevertheless, 
Every bird in New Caledonia woke early and decided to sing about it. Then the cicadas joined in, less a chirruping than heavy marching. Gradually, silver light seeped into the dark and shapes came to life. A banana tree, a rock. The birds went back to sleep, the cicadas settled down. She told herself that if anything was going to eat her, it would surely have started by now and dared to close her eyes. She managed 30 minutes, then she woke again. Rain was falling all over her. It had been the most awful night of her life. The gap between making a plan and actually doing it was unbridgeable. Nothing Professor Smith had taught her had prepared her for this. Nothing she'd read had prepared her either. She was covered in insect bites. They'd even got inside her ears. She was soaking wet, possibly rotting, and she felt wrung out from lack of sleep. Worse, her body had seized up. The only way to get out of the hammock would be by extending herself in segments like a foot rule. She had no idea how she would walk another step. Already she knew she was in something she was not made for. She thought of the British wives at the consulate party listing everything they missed from home. Branston pickle, grey drizzle, perfect English grass. They were right. Faced with a rainforest, she felt desolate. Back at home, she had a flat with a bed in it, clean sheets and a nice bedside lamp. She missed street lights, windows, curtains, roads with proper names. Rationing was better than this. And even though her aunts had taught her it was wrong to cry, even though she hadn't done so at her mother's funeral, a million tiny dots seemed to prickle her nose, culminating in a salty rush as tears filled her eyes. She hadn't a clue why she was lying in a hammock on the other side of the world, already half crippled, looking for a beetle that had never been found. She could die out here under these alien stars and no one would know. She thought of her father, her mother, her brothers. She thought of the professor, Barbara and her aunts. And the more she thought about the people she'd lost, the more she wanted them back. Her crying wasn't about missing home anymore. It wasn't about Branston Pickle or green grass and roads with proper names. It was something else. It had been with her ever since her father had walked out of his French windows and left her behind. You might travel to the other side of the world, but in the end it made no difference. Whatever devastating unhappiness was inside you would come too. Marjorie lay in her horrible hammock and she sobbed. Thank you so much, Rachel. Um, I mean, it's utterly sublime, Miss Benson's Beetle. Um, there is so much to enjoy in this novel and it really lifted my spirits throughout this real sense of adventure. Um, and because that, that sense of adventure really grows as Marjorie and Enid reach their final destination. So why New Caledonia and what research went into that? Originally, I thought, I promised it was just going to be in the UK because that's kind of where I, you know, that's where I write about. And uh, then I just thought, hang on, this is an adventure. You said this was an adventure. So you've got to take away everything from yourself that you normally rely on. So um, I then thought maybe I'll set it in France. And uh, every time I wrote about Marjorie and Enid standing outside the boulangerie, I just thought, hang on, we've been here. We've all done this. We've seen it before. This has got to be an adventure for not just for the women, but for the reader and me. So then I thought, OK, other side of the world, find somewhere you've never been, you know nothing about. And New Caledonia fit the bill rather kind of magically. And then I realized there really isn't much fiction available about it. So I kind of, I really did see that I was, I had a challenge, I had a proper, proper challenge. And I had to do masses of research, but it was all through letters, journals, old maps. I even found this pamphlet that was issued to the GI soldiers when they were based in New Caledonia during the Second World War. And it was, it was kind of basically, um, this is a very nice island. And if you just say bonjour, you'll be fine was kind of the gist of it. But you know, that, 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 was, that was my research. I had to use, I, there was no fiction. I had to use nonfiction and maps. And that was felt really liberating when I finally got it. That's terrific. And, and there is, there's a character in this novel. Marjorie has her own stalker, who yes. is uh, a, a soldier suffering with PTSD. Uh, yeah. And all kinds of mental health issues. Why was that character particularly, why was it important to bring that character in? It was, it felt important to me because it is, it is such a celebration of women that I felt I needed to show what had happened to some men, not all men at the end of the Second World War, that there was this inability to 
I mean, the, the suffering had been so extreme that the kind of ability to empathize and connect was, was shattered. But actually, I hadn't intended to have any men in the book. I'm sorry to say, I just thought it would be just women. And Miss, this man was just one of the applicants that comes along when Marjorie is looking for an assistant to go to the other side of the world. And he was just supposed to come in and not be right for the job and then go. That was all he had to do. But every time I wrote that chapter, his bit got longer and longer. And I just, in the end I thought, this man can't believe the book isn't about him. He just can't let go. So. I then thought, okay, well, I'll go with you. So I just sat there one morning and just, I just kind of allowed myself to kind of go with his stream of consciousness and see where it would take me. And then I thought, well, actually this is useful because this is an adventure story and in adventures you're always being chased. So um, I think I can allow him to come. Yes, indeed. And uh, and that's, that's actually really interesting because in a way what you, get this sense of as well is this sense of giving hope which for me felt like it was really important to you to give readers hope as Marjorie and Enid, Enid reached their destination. Yes yeah. I think more than ever before I felt it because because it's about women and I feel so positive about you know what women can do when they come together when you know, it's, you know and the, even though if they may be really mismatched but when Women do stand together. I think something quite electric happens and something really creative. And so I really wanted to celebrate that. Yeah, and against a backdrop where I suppose they were rather unusual because they were on their own yes. uh, traveling together. Yes, and, and they're also, you know, to, to, in the male world, they would be seen as kind of frumpy teacher and dumb blonde. That's what they would be. And so it, it was kind of really important to show everything that was behind that and to really keep subverting the, the kind of roles and, and the way that they were perceived and the way that we would perceive them. Yes, yes, great. Now, um, Rachel, your books, they've, uh, they're translated into 36 languages. Uh, you've written over 20 original afternoon plays and adaptations of the classics for BBC Radio 4, including all the Bronte novels. Um, and you moved to writing after a long career as, a, as an actor, performing leading roles uh, for the Royal Shakespeare Society, the National Theatre and Cheek by Jowl. Has there been any attempt to put your work on the stage or screen? There, there is talk of, of the stage, or as I say, there was talk of the stage. I mean, uh, you know, I feel very, very, very fed up about the theatre at the moment and so sad. But in terms of screenplay, yes, um, uh, definitely. Um, I'm now working on the screenplays for The Unlikely Pilgrimage of Harold Fry and The Music Shop. That's terrific. I think, yes, I don't know whether it's because, you know, maybe people need kind of cheering up a bit. I mean, you know, maybe that's its most basic. So maybe I suddenly, you know, fit the bill. Yeah, yes, absolutely. And Steve, I'm sort of waving at you. Uh, I'd love to bring you into this. Uh, bit of the conversation because Before I Go to Sleep was made into a film and Second Life has been uh, optioned by the queen of book optioning, Reese Witherspoon. Uh, how different did it feel for you to see your book on screen? Was, was that a peculiar experience? And any insights you'd like to share with Rachel and our audience about the process and how involved you got with that? I'm sure Rachel will be fine. I think she's, uh, you know, in there and but uh, yeah it was a, it was a, it was the most surreal uh, incredible experience um you know i mean for me i've never had the situation where it's something that had begun in my head as an imaginary you know flight of fantasy uh, i look up and see see it being embodied by not only by an actor who's who's doing it so well but also by an actor who's nicole kidman <laughs> who's kind of an oscar winner it's it's very surreal to uh, to see scenes and 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 lines of dialogue and things that I'd imagined, um, walking and walking and talking and, and being there. So yeah, it was a very odd experience. But it, I was uh, I made the decision not not to get involved really at all. I was very lucky because I had a very good working relationship with Rowan um, Doffy, who wrote the screenplay for Before I Go to Sleep and also directed it. So uh, you know he would email me with ideas and thoughts that he'd had and get my opinion. But I made the decision that unless I really seriously disagreed with something. I would just let him do his thing, and then I would just enjoy the whole process, which I did. It was a, it was a. I think I, I slightly made a nuisance of myself by trying to turn up on set every day. But, 
it, and I think the first day I was there, I think everybody there was rather worried that I was there to complain and, you know, say, well, that's not the right shade of uh, paint on the walls. And that's not, you know, they've got that costume wrong. But actually, it was, the, it was the opposite. I was there. I was almost like just like a kid in a sweet shop. I was just there sitting and kind of just agog at, at everything that was going on around me. So, yeah, it was, it was a great experience. It was a really, really great experience. And Rachel, do you think you'll get, you'll get so involved in, in, in the development of yours? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, I, th I think when I'm writing them, so I feel very involved in the moment. Um, and then I don't know, I mean, I'm happy. I'm, I'm happy to, the people who are producing it and making them, I feel very happy to hand them over. We've got a very good working relationship. So, um, but the only thing is that films have to go through so many hoops in order to get made, whereas I mean, books have to go through hoops, but actually they, they, it seems simpler. Yes. Well, we, well, we've got quite a few questions coming through and uh, this one is, is uh, relevant to what we're discussing and it's from Jonathan Simpson and he wants to know if the experience of having your book made into an excellent film has changed your approach to writing. Steve? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, it, in a way, it sort of has, yeah. Not not in the way you might think. I don't I don't sit and when I'm writing and think, well, this might be a film or a TV series or whatever one day. So therefore, I need to, to do X, Y, and Z. I'm still I'm not thinking of that as as an end product when I'm writing. But um, an experience on the set before I go to sleep did actually make me change things slightly. I was it was uh, I don't know if you've seen the film, but there's a there's a scene in which um, it's a very dramatic moment towards the end of the film, and it's it's shot outside. Uh, the house and uh, I was there on set that day um, and it was a freezing freezing cold day in sort of February I think it was March and uh, it was raining as well and the, and this and the scene required rain but they had to have a rain machine even though it was actually raining because apparently real rain doesn't show up uh, on the screen uh, so um, it was a, it was just a, like and anyway so Nicole Kidman and Colin Firth had their scene and they played it played it out and um, then I bumped in Nicole Kidman was on her way to her caravan probably to cry, I imagine, because she was sort of soaking wet. The wig was flat all over her, you know, makeup running and everything. She looked to state. And I, and I said to her, I asked, you know, we had a few words and I said, oh, um, just for the record, I said, in the, in the book, this scene that you've just played, it takes place inside uh, by a roaring log fire in, the nice warm, in a nice warm living room. And she said, um, and she wasn't being sort of nasty or difficult or awkward. She just said, yeah, but this is much more dramatic, isn't it? And, and I thought, actually, yes, it is. And so now when I'm writing, I think I do, I'm always constantly thinking, are there any other ways I can bring drama or bring emotion into the scene other than just by what's going on and what's the dialogue? You know, are there any ways I can make Nicole Kidman as uncomfortable as possible when she's playing it in the film? You know, I'm joking, but yeah. So I think it does, it, does, um, it does affect me in that way. I'm sort of, I'm always thinking now about, is there somewhere more exciting or dynamic or relevant um, that I can set this scene? That is great, though, how that experience has sort of influenced and shaped how you write certain mm -hmm. scenes to make them more, more dramatic. Thank you. Um, and I'm just going to take these two questions for Rachel as well at this point. Um, Rachel, we have an ex cheek by jowl uh, at this event. Barbara Matthews has a question for you. She's just finished reading The Music Shop with enormous pleasure and Perfect is about to be packed in my holiday luggage. I listened to the music that Frank recommended as I read, a wonderful multi-sensory experience. To what extent is music essential in your life? Your writing would suggest profoundly? Yes, it is. It's really, really important to me. I mean, it is, um, but when I started writing the book, I didn't understand why. I think, I'm sure Steve will agree that when you, when you start writing a book, you, or you go from a place of not knowing. Mm. You, know, you accept that you're going to go on some kind of journey. And I knew that music really, mo it really gets me. But, and it's sort of like, there are tracks that I think of as, you know, they take me right back to a certain point in my life, but I'm not a musician, I'm not a singer. I can't talk about music in the way that some people can talk about it. So it felt really important to me to go to music and try and understand why it, why it gets under my skin the way it does, and then to try to use words in my way to make music you know, come onto the page. And it's such a big challenge for a writer uh, that, yeah, I, I, f I felt it was an important one to take on. And another related question for you, Rachel, is, is about the music shop. What, 
and, and Harold Fry, I guess, how do you situate them? It's from Laura Marks. How do you situate them when trying to get them published? How do you pitch it? Oh, um, I think, I, well, you'd think on paper they wouldn't really work. You know, like an ordinary man works the length, walks the length of England to save a woman from dying. It sort of doesn't really, I, don't, I mean, it's not, it's not thrilling. And neither is a man owns a music shop and heals people with good music. But I think there's something every day about both those stories. And then, so there's something kind of archetypal about them. And I think when you start to move into that area, um, there, are res there are kind of resonances all over the place. And then I think the stories really do come alive. But, but on paper, I admit, they might, you know, if I had to do my lift pitch, you know, where you do it in one minute before somebody gets to the top floor, I might have been sent back down to the bottom there. <laughs> Steve, you're smiling. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, well, I was actually just thinking about, especially with Harold Fry, how can you say it's not thrilling? I think it is thrilling. It's about, it's about ordinary braveness, I think, isn't it? And uh, yeah. Yeah, but I, it was just, I was, I suppose I was, a lot of things that Rachel said have really chimed with me with this book, because especially what you were saying about, um, about uh, not wanting any men in it because I sort of almost had the opposite experience. I, I, I wanted to make, I wanted to put a man in the center of this, not in the center, but equally in the center of this book. So I did several drafts in which it was half narrated by a male character and half by the female character, but every single time all the way through the, the female character, Alex, who is now the narrator of the book, um, was like sort of tapping me on the shoulder going, you know, this is my book. This is my book. Get rid of his section. <laughs> it's funny, isn't it? How these, and they are imaginary people. Yeah. How they, um, they do become so real that they really have an influence mm. on a book that you're, you know, you're writing. Yeah. Yeah. They just don't do the work. We have to do the work where they just make all the demands. Wouldn't it be great if they just went <laughs> with the influence? Wouldn't that be fantastic? <laughs> So, Steve, we're, we're going to come to you now and to talk about your third novel, Final Cut. And one of the things that struck me so much about uh, Final Cut was the sense all the time of claustrophobia and, and intensity of a, of a sinister seaside community. Mm. And at the heart of this book is a documentary film filmmaker, Alex. So can you say a little bit about the inspiration for Final Cut and where the character of Alex comes from? Yeah, uh, with Final Cut, I was, um, I, I've been interested in a long time about documentary. Uh, and I think it's especially relevant at the moment, because I think there's a real sense that we have as a society now, uh, that we have to document everything, and, and everything is kind of there. And, it's, and to be cliched about it, you know, it's like, you can't even have a brunch anymore without feeling you need to, well, I'm being, I'm generalising, but without feeling that you need to Instagram it and share it on YouTube and Facebook and whatever. Um, and that's kind of really fascinates me because it's something that I didn't grow up with. You know, I had a private life and I didn't, there was no sense of kind of having any part of it shared. So I think that kind of sense, that drive to document things is, is, is one of the elements that played into Final Cut. Um, but I was also fascinated by um, kind of the seaside and the landscape, I suppose. Uh, I was very taken with a place in North Yorkshire called Robin Hood's Bay where the book isn't set, but uh, anyone who's been to Robin Hood's Bay will, will be able to make the connection. I've deliberately fictionalized it because of the terrible things that go on there in my book and it's a beautiful, and Robin Hood's Bay is beautiful. But um, I was so taken by the landscape, which is a new thing for me. I think the previous two books have been um, very internal and domestic. Um, the second one less so, I suppose, because parts of it were set in Paris and Berlin and so on, but still it was very kind of urban and, um, and the threat was very much coming from, from inside. So I wanted to explore a slightly more, um, well, to bring some landscape, I suppose, into my writing. So those are two of the big elements, really. Um, but then, yeah, like, like I think I'm always, I'm always returning on some level to kind of this idea of, of memory and identity. And so in some ways it kind of, it's a reinvestigation of that a, bit, a little bit like before I go to sleep. So I, I began to look at uh, and to think about the darkness. I wanted to write about ordinary life. Uh, but the darkness that actually hides not very far beneath the surface. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I had this idea of a documentary filmmaker who goes to make a film um, based on and using um, footage shot by the actual residents of this town. Um, but in in seeing that and in hearing those stories, 
she begins to realize that there's lots more going on that yeah that's uh she only is beginning to understand herself so yeah so that's kind of where it came from yeah i mean place does play a really big part in this because you place alex in in blackwood bay uh as the location of her next film and in mm -hmm. some ways what you do is you you set her free to tell her story that she needs to tell but yeah she gets more than she bargained for doesn't she she does get more than she bargains. It's, it's a, <laughs> I think possibly even more than Before I Go to Sleep, it's quite a difficult book to talk about without giving anything away because the first twist happens quite early on. So there's not a lot I can say, but yeah, I mean, she does find that she, I mean, we know at the beginning that she's been to Blackwood Bay before and that, um, that when, when it's first mooted as a possibility of a place where she may go and make this film, she does not want to go there. She doesn't want to return there. Um, and you know, we, we do learn why that is, but she's got a lot of things that she herself doesn't realise that she has to find out, I suppose. Is that, is that a good way of putting it? Yeah, yeah I think it is. And, yeah, and I think also what's really intriguing about Alex is that she has a particular approach to making a film, you know, as you've mm. mentioned. Um, the rise of just putting everything out there. She crowdsources the footage and mm. people are free to upload online for all to see. And then she, she curates that, that footage and it's through that filter and mm. Alex's own memory that we are drawn into the characters and, and yeah things begin to turn very very dark mm. and um, uncomfortable I would say yeah. but yeah. it's it's utterly gripping because you want to know more and so <laughs> it is <laughs> it is utterly gripping and yeah I mean I am really intrigued by that the whole themes around memory and identity and why you sort of return to that for this book. I am as well. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I'm joking, but it, I think, I don't know if Rachel would agree, but I think a lot of our preoccupations with writers, they're not something that we're, which are necessarily conscious, but they're not something we sit and think about, well, well you know, the, these are the areas in which I work. And there's a, there's a reason why we're drawn to the subject matter that we're drawn to. Um, and, I, you know, so I, yeah, we, before I go to sleep, there was, there was a reason I was drawn to that material. There was the reason I was drawn to that idea of a woman with amnesia. And with now with Final Cut, there's a reason why when I was thinking about all the things that, around place and around documentary and around filmmaking, there's a reason why I, I felt I needed to put that, or the book needed that extra layer of, of, um, of uh, the question marks over identity. Um, maybe it's because I've struggled with who I am over the years, perhaps. Um, but that's probably a conversation for me and my therapist. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I think I think it's an interesting. One. I think I do think many people actually, if not if, if if they don't struggle with who they are, but there are question marks and there are because you know we're all different people in different situations. We're all different. I'm a different person now talking to you on on this call, and then I then I will be in an hour's time when I'm you know sitting in front of the TV with my dog on my lap. You know, but I'm this I'm the, I'm the same person as well, but I'm just presenting different aspects of myself. So. I think that kind of has always fascinated me and, I, and I, it's something that I've, not, I've obviously not quite sorted out in my head yet. No, I think we can all relate to that and certainly in terms of the way uh, people live their lives out on social media mm. too and, and, and the multiple roles people take on and the multiple identities that come with that. Um, Steve, would you like to read an extract now? I will, yes. Um, so I'm going to read a, a short section from about a quarter of the way, I think, through the book. Um, so we're with Alex, who, as I said, is in this is in this town, this village, to make a documentary, and uh, she has learned of a girl, a young girl, who um, took her own life apparently by uh, jumping from the cliff edge. And there are lots of rumours in the village about what was really going on and what may have driven a, the girl to that. And so Alex has decided to investigate, I suppose, and we're joining her when she's visiting. For the first time, a guy, a man called David, who lives in a big spooky old house um, on the cliff edge, which is uh, just near where the girl Daisy jumped from. So, uh, yeah, so that's where we are. So, <clears throat> there's no answer. David, I say, peering through the stained glass. Are you there? Nothing. I wait, then try again. I knock at the door so loudly this time that it judders against the frame, rattling the letterbox. Now there's a noise. It sounds odd, like it's coming from deep in the house or beyond it somehow. 
A light flicks on in the hall, then through the pus-coloured pane of glass I see a figure approach, head down, blurry and wraith-like. Only when he's right in front of me, when all that's separating us is the door itself, does he look up. His features are indistinct, distorted by the window. He slides a bolt and the door opens a fraction, held back by a chain. Yes. His voice is thin and reedy. Is that David? What do you want? I can't see him well. The hall light is behind him, the porch is in darkness. He's tall though and thin, his body angular and his movements awkward. I try to keep my voice even. Hi, I say. I hope you don't mind me interrupting you. I hold out my hand, but he makes no move to take it, and I'm relieved. I don't want him to touch me. His attention seems focused on a spot a little way beyond me. I'm Alex. I'm just... I know who you are. He leans forward. His thin face catches the moonlight. His complexion is waxy. He looks bleached, overexposed. He gives me the creeps, and I fight the urge to run as hard and as fast as I can until I'm miles away. Why have you come here? To find out about Daisy, I think. About Zoe. I drop my hand and he flinches, his eyes dark with a feverish intensity, though he avoids looking at me directly. He scans my neck, my cheek, the side of my head, anywhere but my eyes. He doesn't blink. Even in the dim light, I notice a patch of stubble on his neck where the razor mist, a tiny scar above his lip. He seems desperate to escape, even though he's standing in his own home and I'm the one who's trespassing. I just wanted to ask you about, why have you come to Blackwood Bay? I open my mouth, but the words catch in my throat. Nothing will come out. You need to get out. His voice quivers. He sounds odd, scared, drunk, perhaps. What? It's not safe for you here. You shouldn't have come. His tone is menacingly low. I lean in just a little, then my body is pulling against me. I just, I want to talk to you. Leave. You should never. Wait, I say. He's closing the door. I'm desperate. My chance to speak to him is disappearing. You knew Zoe Pearson? No, he says, no, I'd never, not after what happened. What happened? He says nothing. Talk to me. I glance towards the cliff, at the edge of the cliff. Daisy jumped from here, didn't she? He shakes his head, he looks haunted. David, I say, please, will you help me? I can't, he says, I can't, leave me alone. He lets the door go and it snaps shut. The house shivers. I peer in through the glass, but all I can see is his silhouette, the back of his head. I lean in close. I know my words won't be picked up by the camera, but I'm not sure that matters now. My focus has shifted. I need to know what happened to Daisy, my friend, and to Zoe. Tell me what happened to the girls, David. He speaks then. You should know, he says. You should know more than anyone. I don't react. I can't. What does he mean? In any case, the light goes off and the house falls silent once more. I walk away, back to my camera. It's not possible. He can't have recognised me, surely. Not in the half-light. Not if I didn't recognise him. He can't be the one person in Blackwood Bay who knows who I am. But then it comes to me. What if he's not? What if I'm kidding myself? I look back towards the house and see something there. A figure, half hidden in the dark. It's David, I think. And again, I want to run. But then I realise I'm wrong. It's not David at all, but a girl. She's just standing, watching me. I take a step towards her, but my feet are suddenly heavy, mired in the sludge. I don't know what makes me, but I almost say it. Daisy? But the word catches in my throat, and when I look again, there's no one, nothing at all. The place is deserted. Thank you so much. And it's, it's hard to go any further without giving uh, any of the plot mm -hmm. away, but uh, old <laughs> secrets and you do rise to the surface, uh, I think it's safe to say. Um, thank you, Steve, that was great. We thank have you. some amazing uh, comments and questions coming through. Um, but before we turn to the audience, I wanted to ask you both about your experience uh, of the Faber Academy Creative Writing course. And I asked this question because um, the first event we did in this uh, series was with Tiari Jones and, and Patchett. And one of the questions that was asked was about their experience of uh, the Iowa uh, Writers' Workshop in Iowa City and what it meant to them. And they both were kind of said, well, nothing really. Uh, <laughs> it was a bit of a shocking uh, response. And it just, it, I think it was just really interesting to hear about how often a place um, becomes very well known for its creative writing course, but actually they said it didn't really have 
that much of a big impact on them. How was it for you? Do you want to go first, Mr. Lang? You go first. Uh, okay, well, for me, it was, it was life-changing. Um, I think that was partly, though, because it was exactly what I needed at that time. Um, I, I was working full-time uh, in the health service with hearing impaired people, children. And, um, but my, and my writing was something I, I desperately wanted to spend more time on and, and energy on and wanted to take it to the next level. And, and that course really helped me to focus and it did give me some really good tips. And, and um, But it, it's a tricky one. I mean, I'm quite often I'm asked or occasionally I'm asked whether I would have written before I go to sleep if I hadn't been on that course. And, and I think the honest answer is I would have done, but it probably would have taken me a lot longer because I think um, the only, I mean, I, I, I've always, although I'm, you know, in some ways I'm the, still the poster boy for creative writing courses or some of them at least anyway, but I still, I still maintain that the only way you can really learn to write is by doing it. You know, it's like you can't learn to ride a bike by reading about riding a bike or by, um, by uh, you know, watching YouTube videos about how to ride a bike. You have to get on it and fall off it and get back on it. And, and I think it's the same with writing. But I do think, um, for me, the course just kind of short, was a shortcut and I learned some, some things that I would have taken me longer to learn had I been teaching myself. So it was a great experience. And also, also it kind of, I met, I met my agent on the course as well. So and that, in, a, in that very simple, obvious way, it was very life-changing. So it was great for me. Um, yeah, perfect. Rather handy to meet your uh, agent yeah, there too. Exactly. Yes, Rachel, how was it for you? Well, it was. It was for me. It was slightly different because I had already been writing for radio. For I'd been writing radio drama for a very long time already. But um, I think if there's something really passionate, you know, that you're really passionate about doing, and I was. I mean, books were the thing for me. It was the thing I really wanted to do, but I'd never really given myself the chance to take time out and you know and try and write a book. And so the Faber course was just really part of my commitment to myself that I was going to take it seriously, that need to write a book. And I think that was mainly what I got from it, that I, you know, even, even when there are times when I, I thought, oh, I, you know, I, I'm feeling out of my depth, or I'm, you know, because you hand in work, and I wasn't used to sharing work that wasn't finished. And there are different levels of, um, you know, understanding of writing coming from your peers. So it's, it's a bit of a kind of hodgepodge, but I came away absolutely determined to, to finish uh, the book. And I did start Harold Fry, um, even though it had been a radio play already, I started the, the book during the course and got lots of encouragement. And also met, I have the same agent as Steve and, yeah, met, and met Claire, which was amazing. I mean, you know, that was, I, I couldn't believe it when she took me on. Claire Convoy must have first dibs on everyone that goes through the uh, Faber Academy. So you've made this really important decision and a giant leap onto uh, a creative writing course that is the Faber Academy. And it's a real commitment, as you say, of time and energy to your writing. I mean, could you just give us a little bit of insight into, you know, take us inside the classroom? Um, how, do, how did it actually work for you? And how did you balance it with everything else going on? Uh, did, did you go part-time? Did you quit work? How, how did you balance all the other commitments in your life? I went part-time, uh, but, but that wasn't to do the course uh, because um, the course was in the evening. It was one night a week. Uh, yeah, it was one night a week and one weekend a month, uh, one Saturday a month. So it, in terms of a time commitment, it wasn't that huge. Obviously, there was a lot of reading and writing to be done in, the, in between the uh, classroom, but it was kind of 50-50 I was the first, uh, I was part of the first intake, so I, we were the kind of guinea pigs, really. So it's probably more refined by the time uh, Rachel did it. Although I think you're only the year later, weren't you? I, th I think I came quite quite quickly after yeah. you, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So it was kind of half of it was, was would be sort of, let's, okay, we're going to spend an hour talking about dialogue or talking about um, uh, how to build a plot or something like that, you know. And then... Which it was a lot of discussion based. The tutor, Richard, I think we both had Richard as our tutor, was an, is an amazing teacher. He kind of teaches by stealth, I always think. I don't really know what I mean by that, but it sounds like, um, anyway, so yeah. And then, and, and then we'd spend the other hour of the, of the evening discussing uh, uh, two people's work. So each, each week, two people would, would share 5,000, I think, well, a big yeah. chunk of work anyway, and then we would sort of talk about it. 
So it was kind of half half led by the tutor and half led by by um, or half uh, peers peer kind of critiques. There was there was a um, on one of those Saturdays. I'm sure you must have done this, Steve. Where it was, I mean, I think this came in handy for my book, and it was called something like "Stalking the Character" or something. Kid, like kidnap a character. I still kidnap remember. A character, kidnap a character. That's really, Every so thing was, I've ever done. Yes, you were sent out, and you had to basically go and follow someone without getting arrested, <laughs> and acquire as much information as you possibly could, and report back to the group. And I think that was my, that was the day when I think people realised that because I'd been so quiet, I'd never said anything. And then I think I came back with just a terrific about, I'd been really, really stealthy and really, really stalkery. Really? And I came back with so much information. But it was, I mean, it, when I was writing Mundick, this character, Miss Benson's Beetle, I did often think maybe, you know, maybe I'm just going back to what I learned at the Faber course. Mm. That was a good Saturday, actually. I still, I still, yeah, I, I do that sometimes. I stalk people on trains quite a lot. It's a great way to find, <laughs> I think, when you're stuck. I mean, you know, you just, I, I often think if I'm kind of really hit a point where I don't know what to write, it's so good just to go out where you can see people. I mean, mm. obviously a bit more difficult recently, but just connect with life again. Yeah. You know, what you don't know. Yeah. Some terrific tips and insight coming through for everybody. Thank you. Um, we've got some brilliant questions uh, coming through now. So I am going to go over to uh, Leah Simons. Um, she's got a question for both of you. How long does it take you to write something before you're happy with the final product? I mean, do you have much choice? Aren't the deadlines set for you by the publisher? <laughs> I love missing deadlines. <laughs> I do it very regularly. Yeah, I, I, I probably ought to say no comment at this point. Yeah, um, it, <laughs> yeah no comment. No, um, I, I probably, yeah, I miss deadlines too. I mean, yeah. what can you do? You can promise, because with the bet, you know, you can say, it's def you're definitely going to have this book in six months, and you really mean it, and you really want it to be true. Yeah. But yeah. you can't, until you're in a book, you cannot say how long it's going to take you to find it. And mm. you've got to make mistakes. You've got to be allowed to make mistakes, because that is part of finding the thing. I mean, people often you know, kind of think, do you work with a plan? And I, I say, now, well, the best planning I do is when I finish the book and I look back at it and I go, yeah. oh, yes, that happened. And then I can see what my plan was. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, um, I, absolutely. Yeah, I really like that, you know, allowing yourself to make those mistakes and, you know, not being so hard on, you, uh, on yourselves. And I think, actually, it'd be really interesting to hear about your experience of lockdown um, as well, you know, within this sort of context. Has it been something that has been stimulating to your creative self or have you found it uh, quite inhibiting looking outside the window or looking out onto Twitter, <laughs> in this case and other social media with all the stuff that is going on? I've been very lucky because um, I, was, I was thinking about another book for about um, three or four months before, before, before Twitter started, before lockdown started. And so I was always planning to start writing a new book at the beginning of April um, and so although so when lockdown happened in the middle of March I just thought right I'm just going to carry on and try and, and just try and write this book as it is so I'd already done a lot of the thinking about it but exactly as Rachel said what I have found incredibly difficult is I mean I've, I've got most of it, the first draft of a, of a new book written but I, what I have found difficult is is yes when you when I feel I need to reconnect with the world and to go out and and, and sort of um, recharge the tank, if you like, of, of, and by observing people and 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 going sitting in a cafe and just watching what's happening and sort of picking up on the nuances and things. I haven't been able to do that, so I think that that kind of level, that layer of of um, realism or of, of, of that texture is going to have to come come when um, I'm, I can get out and about a bit more. But I've been very lucky in that context because lockdown has, has meant I can I can just get my head into a book. And I, I've thanked, I've, 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 you know, I've been very uh, fortunate. And, yeah. And Rachel, what about for you? What's uh, what impact is the new normal having on your writing? I found it really tough. Um, I haven't really been. I mean, I've, I've had a few book ideas, but haven't pursued any of them. I think I'd have, if I was a bit further in a book, I might have enjoyed the time. But I think when you're searching for something. Mm when the world is so in such a state of paradox and anxiety, you know, that in some ways life seems normal because I'm used to working at home. There's nothing strange about that. 
And yet, you know, every time I look at the news, I mean, I just see something that, that throws me off balance. So I, I found it really, really hard to get to a place where I imaginatively just feel free to kind of go. Mm. And I mean, fortunately, I do have the screenplays, which I've been getting on with. And, you know, I, I do know the story for those. So I can continue with them. But I've, my brain has been so scattered. Yeah, it it does feel like there is there is so much that needs fixing in the in the world uh, mm. right now. Um, so I'm going to take a few more questions from the audience. So this one is for Rachel from Hillary South. Having read the unlikely pilgrimage and hearing Rachel talk about and read from Miss Benson's Beetle, I wonder how she sees the role of pilgrimage or travel in discovering or healing who we are. Well, I love a quest. I do love a journey. Um, and actually, I'm very glad that I wrote this spectacular journey before lockdown because I feel at the point where people can't travel, I've kind of provided a book that is a kind of exotic, mad, uh, joyful travel book. But I think the quest is a really interesting point in terms of structure because you start with for whatever reason your characters need to address change. You know, they, the, the, the kind of, the status quo cannot continue as it is. And then they, they must go on some kind of journey. And I suppose you kind of, if you're talking about the Holy Grail, they must, they must seek in order to find it. And then they must face all the parts of themselves that they've been unwilling to kind of connect with in order probably to make that find, you know, to reach that goal. So it, as a, as a structure, I think it, is a, for me, it offers, it can kind of work on a literal sense and a metaphorical sense, and then an emotional sense. So it can work for me on many levels, and I like working on many levels. I like telling a really good story, but I also like digging, you know, into kind of what that means or, or the kind of, yeah, the emotional journey of your, of your character. So if you can tie them all in together, it feels a very useful structure. Having said that, I'm not, in my next book, nobody is allowed to go anywhere. I think I have to take that away from myself. But you don't get to make that decision, do you? They get to make that decision. <laughs> they might try and go away. That is absolutely true. <laughs> Thank you. And I think that's actually the really important thing about reading. Yes, reading can heal it can absolutely help build uh, empathy you know i think what's been really interesting seeing all these injustices around the world and how so many people are, are turning to books has has that been the same for you i mean uh steve and i sort of live half of our lives on twitter and it's something <laughs> you know i've discovered so many new books uh, mm. as, a, as a result yeah I, i've been very lucky because I, I mean again from twitter i get the impression that lots of people who for whom reading is a great love, haven't found that they can do it during lockdown. Um, I suppose because I think it, we're all on some level much more anxious and there's a, there's a base level of, of anxiety. And also people are just, I suppose, I'm very lucky because I don't have children. I don't, you know, I live alone and I kind of just get on with things, but that's not your situation. Suddenly you're having to homeschool and try and work from home and, and adopt a whole new way of life. So people haven't been able to read. And I always think oh, that must be dreadful because my entire life, I think reading has been somewhere something that I've done to um, escape, to sort of, to learn, to uh, have a break. I mean, just kind of, it's just, it's just the place I go to, to kind of recharge. I mean, yeah. So it's, it's, it's been equally important, if not more so over the last few months. Yeah. And Mar Mary wants to know, do you think there will be a plethora of COVID novels? Not so much written during, but about lockdown. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> I don't know. It's a funny one, isn't it? Because in a way, it's it's going to be hard to ignore that it happened. But I don't know that people are going to want to read endless books where people are stuck in their homes. Mm. So it's. I mean, it's a bit like I think um, I can't remember who it was who says that kind of. If you set stories before the mobile phone, it, it's always much more. You can get much more out of your plot because basically people just can't ring one another. You know, so it's quite nice sometimes to just be able to ignore major major events. Mm. Um, what do you think, Steve? I won't write yeah, exactly it. that. In fact, it may have been me who said that because that's what I certainly find with crime fiction is it, it, there's, there's the the two time the two time eras before the mobile and after the mobile because they're exactly yeah. the reasons that you said. 
Yeah, and I, I, do, I think there are probably going to be a lot of lockdown novels being written yes. uh, at the moment, maybe, but I don't know how many of them are going to be published. Um, but as you say, Rachel, I mean, I, the book I'm writing at the moment, I'm kind of having to ask myself, to what level do I, do I talk about what's going on right now? Because as you say, it would be ridiculous to ignore it and pretend it hasn't happened or isn't happening. Yeah. Um, but I'm kind of writing a book which, which will be published, you know, maybe a year away, two years away, when hopefully the world will be in a very different place and hopefully a better place, obviously. Yeah. So, so where, where do you, where do I, what do I choose to include and what do I choose not to include now? It's very sort of, it's a difficult thing to think about. Mm. Have, so have you both decided on your next book? And this is a question from Kate. What has been the trigger to write this? I've actually, I've at the, the what I'm going through that stage, you know, where, I don't know whether you do this, Steve, where you, you have an idea and you think, oh, that's a brilliant idea. <laughs> I can't believe nobody's written this. This is brilliant. And you look at your idea and it is golden. You know, it's absolutely beautiful. And then you start to write it and just bits just start falling off it you know, and you can't believe what a met and this kind of beautiful thing you just seem to be stamping all over but yeah. I, I'm going back to an idea I had a long time ago and I'm quite interested I'm a big Beryl Bainbridge fan and I'm really interested in where she went with her novels where because she's such a brilliant storyteller and she understands plotting so well but I'm interested that she went to historical fiction where it feels to me the structure was kind of given to her and then it allowed her a lot more freedom to go into kind of new places with the writing itself and that that really interests me as a as a challenge so i think that's probably what i will do mm. how interesting thank mm -hmm. you um so we're going to take one final question now and it's from pippa and she wants to ask you both how can we build a better world with words Big question. It is. I would say keep using them, keep reading yeah. them, keep speaking, keep listening. I mean, now more than ever, we have to listen. Yeah. Mm. Yes. I think, yeah, I, haven't, I don't have anything to add to that really. I, I think, yeah, just listening. And, and, and I think we're, we're losing the ability to realize that other people can have a different opinion and, and it doesn't mean that they're wrong and you're right and that they're bad and you're good. And I think that's something that is disappearing, which certainly seems to be. And I think we need to remember. And I think that's what fiction, what fiction can do is it can allow you to walk in someone else's shoes for a little while and try and, and actually understand how they may be feeling, someone very different from you. And so I think, yeah, the, keep on reading and writing and listening and talking and using words. Exactly right, Rachel. Yeah, and, 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 and to publish as diversely as possible mm. to yeah. make sure yeah. we are uh, publishing and staging and screening uh, the stories of all people from all backgrounds Absolutely, um, is, is really important. And I, you know, it's been really interesting to see a, a fantastic range of new voices coming through. And I just wondered whether you, you both get involved in mentoring writers in any, in, in, in any way. Do you know, nobody has asked me, but I would love to. I think it would be a really, I mean, I, I feel it would be a really, um, I think I would get a lot from it as well. So well, I'm can. really up for it. Rachel's up for mentoring a writer. Brilliant. Mm. And, and that's definitely something I'm going to do. I, I, about a month ago, I decided that I would mentor um, uh, someone from the, um, the BAME community, uh, because I think those are the voices that are being lost and that people are really struggling. Um, and so at the moment I haven't done anything about it because of the book coming out I'm incredibly busy and I think it would be the wrong time because I wouldn't be able to give what uh, I would like to be able to give and the time and the energy but I think in about a month's time I will be looking for a mentee. Someone I <laughs> that's fantastic and I think that's what it's about generosity and kindness is a big part of building a, a better world uh, with words and uh, through through these fantastic mentoring opportunities thank you both this has been a fabulous hour uh, i wish you all success with uh, with your new books uh, and with all the touring you're doing online <laughs> you just have to sit in your rooms to do that uh, which is terrific um so uh this is a big thank you now from from me to everybody that's been involved in our building a better world with words series thank you to alvia roberts for the sign language interpretation and to pippa and ross at 
at Five Leaves Bookshop for their support and organisation, to Alison Barrow at Transworld Books too. And a very big and very special thanks to Alex Trusker at Maker Met, who sat right opposite me, uh, who <laughs> kept all the tech going throughout the series, and to Arts Council England for their funding, and to all of you for coming and for sharing your comments and questions. Don't forget to uh, fill out the feedback form and let us know if you'd like us to bring you more of these events. We are forever plotting and planning, so, so watch this space. Uh, and don't forget to take up the three for two offer from uh, Five Leaves Bookshop. Thank you so much for joining. Take care and goodbye.